Welcome, marketers. Today, we will be talking about the future label. What does it mean to be a future marketer? How do we look ahead? What does brand marketing look like? And as we look and think about marketing like a pendulum, this pendulum has swung from mystery to smoke and mirrors, selling snake oil to hope in a jar, all the way to the future where a more greenwashed brand messaging is seen. Um, a little bit less authentic, it veers into the extremes of reckless misinformation. So where do we see ourselves in all of this as marketeers? In the next 20 minutes or so, you will learn about myself, about IBA, and you will get a brief history of cosmetics and how the marketing, marketing pendulum has swung in each of these marketing periods, moving from one extreme to the other and back. I will highlight about seven marketing trends that I see in my crystal ball and the challenges that I see looking ahead for us. Finally, we will close up with a quick Q&A, and I definitely encourage you to drop any questions that you may have in the chat or wait for the end of the presentation where I will share my email and I encourage any and all correspondents. Now a little bit about me. Um, I'm an immigrant from South Africa and my father working alongside the government of Nelson Mandela um, to achieve democracy actually through the arts. He was an avid believer in radical diversity and Ubuntu, which basically means that we're stronger together than alone. And I was empowered by this change leadership so with this diverse background, I've always had that behind me as I work on brands. I've worked with all of the big ones from Sephora, LVMH, to Estee Lauder, Bumble and Bumble, L'Oreal, NARS, Clarisonic, More Pacific, all of the big ones. And I sprinkled in a few indies like Trustique and Mullen and Getz more recently. I am thrilled to be with the Independent Beauty Association as their marketing and communications head. So who is IBA? So IBA is the best kept industry secret. And a moment of brutal honesty. I had heard whisperings of IBA and it's formerly known as ICMAD if you had ever heard that before, but I never really truly knew about them as a marketer. Um, and many of you watching this may also not know about us. And so after joining, I wholeheartedly believe that I was missing this in my career completely as a part of my marketing toolkit. IBA is a nonprofit trade association fostering the success of entrepreneurial companies in the indie beauty space. We do it through education, community, advocacy, resources. We actually have a 50 year deep legacy of fostering and helping grow small business beauty brands. But we also have medium and large companies, and Elf Cosmetics is actually our largest brand. And the benefits of joining us expands to every single seat in your company, from marketing, R&D, packaging, legal, regulatory, the list goes on and on and on. And all of the benefits that we offer our members are really vast. And every single person that the brand has working for them gets a complimentary access to their member portal. And there's no charge to this. So I highly, highly encourage your entire team to join, especially the marketers. So let's dive in. I want you to imagine for a minute a pendulum. I see that in my mind when I think about marketing cosmetics and brand messaging. Over the years, ebbing back and forth, back and forth. I want to invite you to join me on a quick history of cosmetics. I promise to be brief. This will not be a history lesson for three or four hours, which this could be. But let's go back about two and a half million years where you see the first signs of cosmetics in the Paleolithic era and the caves of Lascaux in France. They actually found pigment. And here you see that it was known to adorn the body. So that was the first hint that cosmetics is used and connected to a sign of feeling beautiful. And then you go to um, the next chapter that really we see some more signs of history of beauty, which is ancient Egypt, of course, where queens 
use beauty in their rituals. And here the pendulum swings more towards divinity and it becomes that shrouded in mystery and beauty products are connected to divinity and uh, mortality. The, the sad part in this is that I think they did not know this, but a lot of the products like coal used to accomplish that known beautiful cat eye actually had lead. So it could have resulted in a lot of health issues or even death. The first pigment powders for hair dyeing all classes, not just royalty, was found here about 20,000 years ago made from cassia powder. So really, I mean, this shows that it was an everyday household item, hair dye, amongst other oils and items, but also this complete swing to royalty and the mysterious shroud. Then the pendulum swings completely the other way to the Middle Ages, where beauty is seen as blasphemous and it should not be used. So a lot of the beauty rituals are now more... Um, almost, you know, frowned upon until the crusaders came in and ushered in an era of personal hygiene with steam distillation and toothpaste. And then we swing even further down that avenue where about 700 years ago during the 14th century, still in the Middle Ages, we get the bubonic plague. And then cosmetics become even more crucial to hygiene to block the scents within their mosques. They used rose petals and cardamom and cinnamon to help block out those awful odors. So very functional. During the Renaissance, kings and queens used powder on their faces. We all know now that the powders was laced with arsenic and many other harmful um, ingredients. But then we swing from functional to completely flippant and um, the bourgeoisie using cosmetics and it being considered flippant and excess. So it created a bad reputation again for cosmetics where it was kind of frowned upon and there was these also sinister health um, issues that came up with using some of these items. We move to the industrial revolution, which is the first pivotal kind of hint to modern beauty as we know it with, of course, the invention of the printing press and the first mass marketing. Product labels were printed, business cards were printed, materials, catalogs. So in the 1900s, a lot of businesses like Rimmel and Garlon started using more modern advertising techniques. Now, the, the bar for beauty started being set by these ads and there was a lot of um, drive to sell snake oil. They were giving promises to consumers and the products were often highly dangerous and causing permanent health issues. But let's move on from that for a second and you go towards um, promises of the standard of beauty during the start of the Industrial Revolution to fast forward 100 years to World War I, where now cosmetics are doing kind of the opposite, where it's building up feminine strength. It's defining the modern woman. There's more magazines being put out. Men had to go off to war and women had to stay behind to work. And here we see what's coined as the lipstick effect for the first time, where Often when societies are in flux, whether it be a war, a financial crisis, where there's a fracture point, women would turn toward beauty products like lipstick to make them feel better, to take their minds off of it, to have that feminine touch, to make them feel confident. Then in the 20s and 30s, beauty became a choice. You can choose your identity through beauty. So that rebellious spirit started happening in makeup, the individuality. And J. Walter Thompson was a big ad agency at the time. And in 1916, they printed an ad that actually said that 85% of purchases were made by women. So you can see here the marketing and advertising space very early on started us on this road to speaking to women's psyche and, and telling us what we wanted and giving us personas to choose. About 85 years ago is actually when the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1938 was rolled in. And 
this was a great moment, right? We needed this. We needed official guidelines for food and health safety. It did not really exist before. Um, and that was a great moment for the pendulum to kind of be a little bit more in the middle where there was a little bit more guidance. I don't know about transparency, but there was a little bit more of that transparency in terms of what's in the product and for training consumers to read the label and be aware. And in the 50s, World War II helped revolutionize that strong glamour woman again. So we see a nod back to that lipstick effect. We have a sense of belonging and togetherness an attitude towards um, women being perceived again as that pinup. Um, brands like Revlon, Max Factor, Pons, they all focused on patriotism. Some of them even manufactured products like soap specifically for soldiers. But um, I think the, the idea of seduction and usefulness in cosmetics were kind of married in this era. In the 60s, this is the decade of youth and an ever-present rebellious spirit, and we see the first noticeable influence of British pop culture coming into the United States, and it ushered in the 70s liberation, where there was equal rights, and brands became even louder and seductive again versus strength and functional. So again, that pendulum keeps swinging back and forth. In the 70s, it's the first cropping up of natural brands. You have brands like Aveda, Herbal Essences, The Body Shop. They are all coming up with new claims and labeling. The new way of messaging would continue for the next 40 years. Um, and they've added in, as you know, labels like natural, organic, tested on animals, paraben-free, and much more. Some of these claims based on truth, others fell short and is still falling short. So with Mokra creeping up upon us, I wanted to show you this timeline of cosmetic regulations. Let's pause. And as you see all of these on your screen, less than 10 major official updates since the beginning of time has ever been done in cosmetics and beauty. That's it. It was not until the late 1800s before the turn of the century that women started speaking up and wanting more ingredient control and transparency. And in the 20s, with more mass marketing, more regulations led towards this act of 1938 controlling products and goods and labeling. And then whiplash forward to last year when the Biden administration signed the MOCRA bill into effect, which would roll out next year, as you all know. I think more brands need to step up and um, step into the future and get involved with regulations and you know, implement MOCRA in a more diverse manner. We, as IBA, actually work with the FDA to ensure that consumers, indie brands, businesses are getting the best out of these important regulatory updates. So with the history behind us, what does it set us up for, for the future and labeling? In the past few years, so much of the marketing voice has been what's not in products, right? So the pendulum has swung towards kind of keeping that behind locked doors and wordsmithing things to razzle dazzle. It doesn't really create a point of difference. We have so many little labels saying what's not in it and what it's good for and standing on our different soap boxes. And I think it's important to get back to less is more and focus on what innovation inside your product is really helping the consumer with. Marketing and product development needs to be intertwined in all of this. I think we're a little separate still, especially with all of the legislative and regulatory updates. We need to be informed, willing to tackle the taboo topics and be bold. And we can eliminate the stigma of this going back and forth and not being able to rely on us. Um, we want to, you know, not be known as the industry that hides harmful ingredients just to make money, but we also don't want to not make great efficacious products. So how can we make products that really celebrate our true unique selves? How can we become brands that are counted on and go beyond just being good? 
We should produce for the greater good of the consumer. We should put safety standards and regulations in a place that's authentic. And that will actually foster not only safety and reliability for your consumer, but the entrepreneurial spirit that we are supporting with indie beauty brands. Are you ready to go into the trends? Well, through my research and a little bit of a gut check, I landed on about seven trends that I see for 2024 and beyond. The first trend being quality. It's been a rough and tough year for indies, and I foresee the financial strategy will shift from that raw, raw growth at all costs to plans to secure a more reliable, secure future of your brand for reliable growth and stability, quality, not quantity. Small businesses will be less about that shiny draw of celebrities or influencers and more about a promise of reliability of the efficaciousness of a product and what the product or brand's reputation is. The second trend is compliance and ingredients versus, um, you know, bland labeling. It's shift, it's sifting, excuse me for, excuse me, I can't talk. It's sifting through the BS. We need a radical transparency and clear information from us brands. So I guess we all know what Mocha is at this point. I hope you do, but Mocha is rolling into effect next year. And I think it's up to marketers to educate the consumer. Consumers want to see backed claims, not just marketing fluff um, to soft label claims. They absolutely want to see that we are putting their needs first in the most useful manner, um, but not to hide anything. You don't have to divulge your industry secrets. You can build trust in your language and your labeling. Marketing has made strides in cosmetics, but I think there's a long, long road ahead and focus is needed on two areas, in my opinion, diversity and authenticity and strategic communication is needed on the communication and the packaging. There's so much noise out there, both in a clatter for brand success, but also in inaccurate or false claims driven from both consumers and I think marketers. And we need to advocate for the brand to be armed with up-to-date information. And this is an example where the pendulum can swing from fear-mongering and blocking everything that goes into making a product to completely greenwashing and being vague to consumers. And it's actually bad for consumers and it, it's not, it doesn't get us anywhere. We're just spinning at that point. The third trend is being you. A natural less chemical approach is in, showing your freckles, your natural hair texture, there's stressful days ahead. A lot of the trend monitors are showing that. We all know a recession is coming. So making products that are reliable and useful, even multi-use, and providing that balance and relief to meet your consumer's needs will win. The next trend is to not follow the yellow brick road. What do I mean by this? So when it comes to suppliers and manufacturing, the minimum order quantities have lowered to ensure efficacy and efficiency, profitability, and to be the first at market. But marketers need to drive a slightly different conversation and have those conversations with different players in your company. It's vital for a, for a small brand to be nimble and flexible if they want to survive and win. Supplier diversity for the future is crucial crucial, especially entering, entering the uncertainty and the fluctuations of the future. And if we learned anything from COVID with supplier chain, we should be ready to not just follow what's being done and what all everybody's doing is be best practices. Trend number five is time to zoom in. Find your hero. Focus on your top dog. You should create products that are covetable, adaptable, that have a reputation that is strong, that people will come back for again and again and again. The next trend is moving beyond the metaverse. Physical and digital lines are completely blurred. 
this trend of dual realities, living in both the physical and the digital. Even in politics, you see different parties focusing on whatever they're doing in the real world, meeting, campaigns, talking. They want to echo that in digital spaces. We should do that as beauty brands as well, to think of ourselves holistically and beyond the metaverse into this 4D world. What does your products look like in all strategies, in all touch points, in all of the different levers that you're going to pull? There needs to be modern marketing that is holistic, agile, and data-driven, that we can get our ideal customers to have a wonderful user experience and a brand experience. Let's take that personal experience that they share with your brand as modern marketers and understand our consumers at a deeper level. Our consumers are ever-changing. They're chameleons. So we need to be hyper vigilant and hyper focused on our consumer and that does mean entering the metaverse in terms of marketing the last trend i see is preservation scarcity drives more sustainable options and we need to be nimble innovative and resource ready new brand exp expectations need to be in place we're seeing a evolution in the cosmetics industry right where the cosmetics industry is moving beyond trying to do the right thing into doing something that can perhaps be measured, reported on, and implemented long-term. To have those goals and sustainability, as well as other ESG components like diversity and supply chain, looking at cradle to cradle operations, we wanna see all of that flow upstream. We need to make sure that we are producing certifiable, products that are good and have good plans for improvement in the long term. Companies need to look forward to and start to gather data now for the full life cycle. And we need to keep that in place as we thrive in an ever-changing environment. Now that we've seen the seven trends and seen my crystal ball, what challenges are ahead for us marketers in brand building? Well, I see four major challenges for us marketers. The first is not being educated in the full product life cycle. Marketers need to be aware of every point of brand creation, packaging, sustainability, supply trends, ingredients, regulations. It may not be our job, but we need to pull up a chair. We need to make strides now in the industry, and that means banding together and literally fostering that American dream of growth in entrepreneurial brands. We need to cultivate the process so we can create best-in-class brands. I highly want to put in another plug here for IBA because this is where building your community comes in very, very handy. We have multiple touch points. We have opportunities to lean in to different parts of the industry and gather knowledge that would expand your world of marketing. The second challenge is reactiveness. We have small teams. It's a rapid pace. It's a digital, physical, immediate now world. We have so many competitors and there's noise in your area. How are you going to set your brand apart? Well, you need to be ready. You need to look at your data and you need to look ahead. And the third challenge is having a unique, truly authentic, transparent message. So presuming consumers know everything, and they've made up their mind. I think the other mistake we make as marketers is not looking at your data. Your consumers, like we said, they're ever-changing. They're in the metaverse. They're everywhere. So use all of your tools and make smart decisions so you can meet the consumer's needs, however nimble and fleeting. Gather information so that you can educate and educate and educate your consumer. The larger portion of your target sees your marketing efforts, they go to whatever point of distribution they're getting your product, and then they get overwhelmed. They get lost in the shuffle of other competitors, or your messaging is not clear, or the instructions on how to use on the box is not buttoned up, and you may lose them or confuse them. 
So not you not losing that specific brand call and understanding what need your product fills is imperative. Finally, standing apart. With Nielsen reporting that the indie beauty category is approaching over a $31 billion stake in this industry, that is fast surpassing the total beauty category number. It's huge. It's colossal. You can't do everything. So you really have to think less is more. Find that hero in your lineup and fine tune your messaging to connect with your consumer. I want to thank you today for joining me to explore what the future label looks like, how we should market that product, and how we should get ready to win in the future. Thank you so much. I'm going to take Q&As now. <laughs>